What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, an affiliate of Madden America Radio, broadcasting on KBOO in Oregon, sponsored by Portland Hearing Voices and the Icarus Project, and syndicated on the Pacifica Network. Madness Radio is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio and at madinamerica.com. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Eveline Lindner. She's a scholar and the founding president of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies. She was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times for her visionary work. Welcome to Madness Radio, Eveline Lindner. Thank you so very much. It's a great, great, great honor for me to be here with you. It really is a great honor to have someone who's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize on the show. And your impact has been extraordinary around the world in conflict regions, being involved in different peace initiatives. And I became interested in your work because you're really trying to get at the roots of what causes violence and exploitation between people psychologically. And you've identified humiliation and the lack of offering dignity to each other as really at the core of what humanity needs and what it doesn't get when violence comes into the picture. And of course, my own experiences with the psychiatric system, that's the common thread in psychiatric violence is denial of dignity and the inflicting of humiliation on people who are in the psychiatric patient role, as well as professionals who are also caught up in that system. So maybe you should just start by telling us how you got interested in the search for the roots of human conflict and how it is that you became involved in what is now called Dignity and Humiliation Studies. I'm born into a family that has been deeply traumatized by war, uh, the Second World War, but also the First World War in Europe. I'm born in Central Europe into a family that was displaced, forcibly displaced after the Second World War, in addition to the war. So there is a war trauma and a displacement uh, trauma uh, that I am born was born into. I was born into an identity of here where we are, we are not at home and there is no home for us to go to on this planet because of this displacement. So I'm born in a place where I don't belong, where my family doesn't belong, where w- there was this kind of uh, isolation bubble in which I, I, I grew up. Of basically of, of systemic, subtle, subtle humiliation because these displaced people, they were not welcome where they were displaced to, uh, from one part in, in Central Europe to another part. So these people were put into the countryside and of course nobody wanted, you know, the country was destroyed and nobody wanted to have all millions of people who had nothing, who had lost everything. See, like my father, he lost his two beloved elder brothers, he lost his beloved farm that he was to inherit, he lost his father, he lost his homeland, he lost even one arm in, in during the war times as a young lad. So I have been interviewing my father for many, many years, try to get into his head, try to live through these times through him. What I admire about him is that he has really uh, transcended the um, culture of masculinity that was somehow the the basis, the foundation of uh, the, the regime of Hitler and how he learned, how he, he, he learned during this war, how this was empty, this kind of um, macho behavior, macho rhetoric, how he somehow looked through it, how he understood that this is very, very destructive. The, the notion of honor, you know, male honor, national honor, the humiliation of the honor of the German nation after the Versailles treaties after the first world war this was this was the reason for or one of the driving forces behind this second world war the sense in the german population of having their honor national honor humiliated after the first world war so we sometimes kind of think in terms of human nature that we are as humans we're violent and actually you're saying something different you're saying no there's actually dynamic that happens historically and in experience that people are humiliated and humiliated as individuals or humiliated as a culture as a nation 
And then that humiliation and the response to that humiliation is what drives people being interested in extremism and revenge, that there was a historical process of humiliation after World War I that set the stage for what happened and led to World War II. And then that's important for us to think about because these dynamics are present today in the world, people being humiliated and reacting. Yes. Imagine, you know, you think if you think you, you have bought a house and this is some kind of safe haven. And then within a few years, everything dissolves into nothing, you know. It's a bit the same, the same experience that people in Syria are going through now. And how did you personally get interested in studying the process of humiliation at the root of these dynamics? What caught your interest and got you involved with this? From the age of 20 to the age of 30, I uh, studied first psychology and then medicine. But I used, I didn't want to become a psychologist or a medical doctor. I want, I used both studies to, to do my own private anthropological studies all around the world. Because as a medical student, for example, it's not difficult to embed yourself in another culture. I did all kinds of practical courses in Bangkok, in New Zealand, in China, in Israel, in many parts of the world. And my aim was to learn, basically to learn what is the, the core of human nature? What are we humans capable of in hatred and love, peace and war? Coming from displacement, I asked myself, what is my life mission on this planet? And after I finished this doctorate in medicine. And so I, uh, it took me three years to come up with three sentences that can describe your life mission until the end of your life. And I searched and searched. And at the end, the following sentences em emerged. I spoke with everybody and the following emerged. If we say that we as humankind are facing global challenges, global problems, then we need to cooperate globally. What is the biggest challenge, <clears throat> the biggest obstacle to this global uh, cooperation? Question mark. And my intuitive answer was humiliation and this answer came from my experience as a clinical psychologist where i felt that if a family had uh, was in conflict if they had humiliated each other there was almost no way to reconcile them this was the biggest obstacle so this was my experience from my therapy work and then I, uh, I remembered my history lesson from the First World War, the Versailles treaties that humiliated Germany intentionally with the aim to make Germany harmless, to, make, to teach it humility and how this backfired. And <clears throat> so I went to the library and this was in 1995, 96. And I, I thought, okay, if humiliation can lead to war, and after the Second World War, there was the Marshall Plan and there was this upswing for Germany and Germany was embedded as a respected member in the, in the European family. In part out of a recognition that what happened after World War I shouldn't be repeated. The Marshall Plan was an effort to build up and support rather than just punish and further humiliate. So what had happened before wouldn't happen again. Yes. So my my question was, okay, if this is true that humiliation can lead to war and, and respect leads to peace, then there must be a huge amount of, of uh, literature about the notion of humiliation. And I was completely taken aback by the fact that there was almost no serious dedicated research on the notion of humiliation. So I uh, devised a doctoral research project for four years and it was humiliation, the role of humiliation and war and genocide with case studies, studies Rwanda and Somalia and on the background of Nazi Germany. And I got a stipend from the foreign ministry in Oslo in Norway of its uh, United Nations department. And they gave me a four year stipend to write this doctorate, to do this doctorate. So in 2001, I finished this doctorate on humiliation, war and genocide with these case studies. So in my understanding, there's a sense that humiliation is this kind of burning, gnawing, almost jealousy feeling of woundedness inside of us when we feel that someone has taken something 
from us or done something to us that pulls something that's ours away. And then it, it, it burns with such a compelling power that it then impels us to act lashing out, to act in a vengeful, reacting, hating way. Or simply to get very dejected, very apathetic and depressed, you know, that could also be, that is maybe the first reaction, broken down, you know, you, you feel broken down, you feel not seen, you feel not appreciated, you feel you are worth nothing. Treated like an object, treated like you're not you, like you're not a human. In one of your writings, you point to the etymological roots of the word humiliation, which mean being pushed down to the earth. So it's that you don't belong with the rest of us standing up, dignified. You are actually pushed down and become less than. I think with psychiatry, it, it certainly maybe starts before entering into the system or entering into the hospital that someone has experienced this humiliation, but so much of what I see, and, and certainly not everyone, there are many people who experience mental health care and medical care and psychiatry in hospitals in a positive and dignified way, but too many of us do feel that we've been pushed down and not treated as equals and treated as, as objects. And I think this is maybe why the emphasis so much is on listening in the psychiatric survivor movement, because listening is kind of an antidote to that humiliation. You send the message that you are an equal, you are dignified, you are standing with me, you are on the same level, you are a human being as I am, and you deserve that respect and that dignity and that recognition as a counteraction for the denial of it and the humiliation and a way of helping the person bridge out of those feelings and that place of being put down and stepped on and feeling humiliated. You know, as I as I studied this, I became more and more aware of the complexity. There is an added layer of complexity, I think, that is coming from the historical times in which we are embedded. And I often use the example of a, a violent husband who beats his wife. And there is a social worker who knows about that. And he goes to this couple and he talks to the wife and he says, look, your husband humiliates you. You are not, you know, we, we don't no longer live in times where you have to swallow that quietly. It's not nature's order. It's not divinely ordained that he can beat you. No, we are now living in times where we have the notion of human rights, of human dignity, which entitle you to withstand that beating and to raise up and to uh, protest and to do something about it. And uh, if the, the husband were to listen to that, the husband would say to the social worker, get out of my house, you're disturbing the peace of my house. Before you came, everything was peaceful. And the wife, and that is the point also with psychiatric, uh, psychiatric patients, the wife is in a very, very difficult situation because she might have absorbed the belief that she believes to be beaten, you know, the, uh, that to be beaten is right. The, she might have absorbed that belief, you know. The, the, um, when I was working in Egypt uh, as a psychologist uh, in these years, I think it was more than 90% of, of Egyptian women believed that her husband was entitled to beat her. I think if she didn't put the dinner in, in, on the table in, in time or if she refused sex, uh, there were certain things she should not do, and then she was entitled to beat her. And this was normal, <clears throat> you know, for them. It was not humiliating, it was normal. And then you have, the, in the West, you have, or you have women who say, if my husband doesn't beat me, he doesn't love me. So, um, so there you have this historical shift from, from one setup, from setting, I call it the, in my vocabulary, my terminology, I call it the ranked honor the world of ranked honor, the universe of ranked honor, where the man is up, for example, and the woman is down, and the man's duty is to humiliate his wife so that she should learn humility, that she should learn to respect this hierarchy. And in that situation, the wife many times buys into that. 
And okay, now comes the social worker and he has har hard times to speak to the husband, but he might have even harder times to speak to the wife and to somehow convince her that she has a right to, to feel humiliated. So in a way, the social worker teaches the wife to feel humiliated where she might not feel humiliated before. So, and this is part of a historical change, a historical shift in the arrival of human rights uh, ideals, for example. The human rights ideal, uh, the core sentence is every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. And this is a promise that was not there before. Yes, and this was one of the positive outcomes of World War II was that there became this broad, wide recognition that all humans, just by virtue of being human, deserve equal dignity. And it, it formed the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And what's, what is so important to know is that this sentence in former times would go as follows. It would go, every human being is born unequal in worthiness and rights, and some are therefore freer than others. That would be the sentence that the man who beats his wife would think is right. And even the wife might think it's right. And now she has to learn the new realm of, I call it the world of equal dignity. The world of equal dignity is in a way incompatible with the world of ranked honor. And so these two universes, moral, ethical universes, and you know, moral feelings, they are, uh, they are in, in, in constant negotiation. And we see that when today in right-wing uh, movements who say, no, 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 the woman must go back into the house. You know, what are these feminists? They're destroying our culture. Well, this raises such an important point because is it true that these values, the dignity and the equality and the recognition are universal or does that become one standard that a culture says is universal, but actually it's being imposed on other cultures, that other cultures may not share those standards and shares that principle of dignity and equality, and then it becomes another form of colonialism. So I guess my question is, is it possible to have a universal recognition of dignity and equality at the heart of building a nonviolent world and at the same time not just slip into the universal projection in the name of corporate influence and neoliberal version of democracy and the imposition of one colonial culture on another. Are those two concerns actually reconcilable? I think this is the big, big challenge we have as humankind at the moment. Very historical challenge. You formulated it very well. People sometimes ask me what is really the heart of what my work is, and really all I see that I'm doing is bringing the basic standards of decency and caring and love and dignity that we have in life in general to the medical context, to the psychiatric context, that there's nothing there that somehow removes our responsibility to be caring and respectful to each other, and certainly not a diagnosis um, that would somehow be permission that now you have schizophrenia, now you're psychotic, now you're bipolar, we don't have to give you the same care and dignity. And I think this is what is so powerful about your work is that the way in which the language of dignity and humiliation frames it more deeply intimate than a language of human rights, which is sort of legal and certainly important, but there's something very interpersonal that is touched on when we talk about dignity and humiliation, which absolutely plays out in medical and psychiatric contexts and then can be generalized in terms of what we want for everyone in all settings of all human experience. So in the psychiatric context, we point out that when someone in a position of authority says you are now diagnosed, you're borderline, you're bipolar, you're psychotic, that I have reason on my side, I get to question you, I get to interfere with your life, I get to interview and look inside and force you to reconsider your own motivations and your selfhood and question even the biochemistry of your body, that in essence, this is a humiliation move, that there's something at the heart of diagnosis, which is putting the other person 
down and humiliating them. Now, of course, there may be legitimate expertise that can be brought in without humiliating the other, but the real dilemma that a lot of us talk about in the movement quite a lot is that if this humiliation dynamic is going on and someone has just submitted to it, that they now embrace their kind of one-down, unequal, I'm less than point of view, I will surrender not just legitimate expertise, but the authentic respect for my being, I will surrender that in the name of this authority, then what do we do as people on the outside? Do we just say, well, you know, this is a choice, this is what somebody is doing, or do we recognize, wait a second, there is huge power imbalance here, but it doesn't work to then impose ourselves and our point of view, and in a sense, our power to tell the person, you're being humiliated, you need to stop this. I mean, we see this in domestic violence situations, we see this in all kinds of workplace abuse. We see this in all kinds of conflicts in the family. So the solution that I think the movement has come up with, and I I think it's a good solution, is to create contexts where people are freer to explore and to hear different points of view, where they can be offered different kinds of considerations and they can start to experience what it's like to be dignified and to be respected and to not be humiliated and to actually be lifted up to an equal level And then once they start to feel that in other realms, then they have something to compare it to. And then they can go back into their medical context and say, wait a second, why is it that my doctor or my therapist or my social worker or my nurse or whoever it is, is not giving me the kind of dignity that I know that I I deserve? And then they can themselves, not as an imposition from the outside, but from within themselves, start a liberation process and start standing up and start saying, look, I also deserve dignity here. I deserve to not be humiliated. I want to be respected and treated as an equal. Because, of course, if we truly empower the other and we truly respect and dignify them, then we have to recognize, well, actually, maybe we don't understand. Maybe we need to listen more deeply in the things that we see from the outside as being humiliation and the person is being put one down. Actually, maybe there's a logic of empowerment and dignity that we didn't recognize, that we didn't see. And This actually comes up a lot in domestic violence work that from the outside, a social worker may say, she just needs to leave him or she needs to say no to this behavior. And then they start to put the person down because they're not standing up. Well, actually, maybe there's something more going on here. Maybe there's some empowerment that's going on on the inside or some protection of dignity that's happening that we can't see. And so we, again, play the role of the colonialist or the imposing of values from the outside, and I think there's a parallel here with the universal kind of enlightenment, liberal, rational tradition that says, well, you know, we have equal rights and then we want to impose this on other cultures, but actually those cultures that may on the outside look like they're having oppressive and undignified dynamics may actually have something more going on that if we would actually listen to those cultures more, we would discover what's going on. Yes, absolutely. I think the the parallel here is the um, the man beating the wife. This would be the psychiatric system, and I worked in it, and I left it because I could not stomach this humiliation as a doctor. And uh, so, so this uh, this is kind of the man who beats the wife, and. Um, and I am. I want to become the social worker who approaches this situation and finds out, you know, what, what, where is the core of the situation? And now, uh, after so many years of studying that, I have a, a kind of very simple image that I I find uh, correl- correlates with my experiences. If we uh, take the human body and and uh, we we look at the past 10,000 years since the Neolithic Revolution, since uh, about 10,000 years ago, then we had all over the world, uh, and I, I analyze in my in my work how it came about that everywhere so-called dominator societies arose, 
with a strongman at the top, a uh, young man being trained to kill and die at the war, at the frontier in, you know, in defense of, of enemies and women being inside having to raise the next generation. This is the, the, the dominator's model of society that Rian Eisler, uh, a, a researcher, uh, describes with very well. And in that context, the man has the duty to, uh, to humiliate the wife to teach her humility that is his duty and the wife believes it's 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 right that she suffers that and um so then comes the big turning point which is basically this human rights this sentence every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights this is a huge turning point and uh so this uh, is a completely different world that opens up with, th with this kind of set of ideals. And my way of explaining the difference and how my position there is the following. During the past 10,000 years in these dominator uh, societies, in this cultural context of ranked honor, um, the man had the right to use his right arm, the sword arm, he had the right to strategize, to decide. The top man, the powerful man, were, were the ones who decided and strategized. And the, but the left arm, the arm of nurturing, of maintaining, was bound behind their backs. They would not change the diapers of their babies. The, the situation would be the opposite for women, most women and lowly men. They would have their right arm bound behind their backs they would not be able to decide and strategize they would have only their left arm which with which they should then raise the next generation they maintain the household and, and harmony and everything so this was a kind of um situation during the past ten thousand years where everybody could only use one arm and uh, the human rights uh, ideal freeze people freeze people to use both arms like those who were supposed to only uh, nurture and harmonize with their left arm they can also now take out the the right arm for example women can now learn how to lead and men can take out their left arm they can learn how to change the diapers of their babies and take the you know so the chance that this human rights revolution gives us is that we that it liberates us it liberates us to use all of our faculties all of our potential that we are no longer mutilated before a, everybody even the man the powerful man who would beat his wife would was or needed to be emotionally mutilated in a way so this is my kind of take after after many many years of of, of looking at the situation that i think yes the uh, human rights a message of equality and dignity for everybody. This is a liberating message. And even those who are still beholden by the old system the, or the traditional system of ranked honor, who believe uh, in, in, in that order, they of course will object. You know, the man will say, as I said to the a social worker, no, 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 I'm right. You are humiliating me when you take away my privileges. He will not understand that as the psychiatric uh, psychiatric system will be very angry uh, possibly say no 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 we are the experts you said something very important bringing up the issue of men because we're not just talking about an economic system that puts some people at the top and some people at the bottom your image of having your left hand tied behind your back is, is very apt because what we're talking about is a dynamic that actually mutilates both the people at the top and the people at the bottom it mutilates men and women and I see this so much in my work that it's so hard. There's so much suffering underneath the surface of the gendered male identity and whatever power is being wielded, whatever privilege is being given to compensate for that really doesn't erase all that pain and all that wounding. It's a false kind of bargain that happens, but the pain is very deep and very real for, for men who suffer tremendously. And this is not to minimize the real exploitation or the very real privileges and freedom that those on the top, that men have, that women so often don't have. But at the same time, there's some mutual loss. There's something that we both lose, the people at the top 
and the people at the bottom. And this, I think, is the power of nonviolence to recognize that while at the same time being on the side of the oppressed pushing up against, but somehow also recognizing that it's in everyone's interest that the dynamic holds the promise for the humanity of all, not just the humanity of the people at the bottom getting their humanity, but all of us regaining our humanity. So there's a sense in some way that that men are almost more damaged because we have so often lost this nurturing, this connecting, this sensitivity side that women are maybe given the space to have on the condition that they stay one down with it in the society. And often it's that wounding that drives men to hold on so strongly to that position of authority and that privilege and that one-up spot because it's so painful because they don't have the skills or the tools or the capacity that's been taken away from them as part of their wounding to do the kind of self-care, the nurturing, or the connection that might help carry them through a process of letting go of that privilege and that power. And this is so important about your work and points the way forward is really recognizing the mutuality because if we just go on the attack, if we just, from the position of being one down, attack the one at the top, then we unleash a humiliation dynamic that ultimately is going to undermine the larger process because it's just going to start circling around. We're not going to realize that there is a commonality and a mutuality at the core that we can all benefit from. And certainly the one on the bottom needs to challenge and push and rise up and be speaking. But if we just stop there, then we reignite the whole humiliation process and then we go around in a circle. And I think this dynamic is now playing out with the rise of right-wing populism and the rise of the conflict between men and, live, men and women and racial politics in the United States. And that's not to say that there aren't very, very self-interested, exploitive, corrupt um, political interests that are exploiting these don- dynamics. I don't think that the dynamics just give rise to the politics kind of from the ground up. There are those who exploit it from the top and they need to be held in check. But this is very much a part of what's going on right now. We have to be cautious about that, very cautious about that. And of course, it's very hard to talk about this because you don't want to take the side of like, well, we're all hurt. We're all actually mutually damaged. We're all equally hurt and we're all equally oppressed because that's actually not what's going on. There actually is an unequal privilege and there is an unequal exploitation. There is a one up, one down, and that does need to be challenge, but at the same time, it needs to not be challenged in just the way that's going to only reverse the roles and re-inflict the humiliation, because ultimately we're all going to lose if we do it that way. So there needs to be a way out of this trap that we have found ourselves in. Yes. So in my doctorate uh, with the case studies of Rwanda and, uh, and Somalia, especially Rwanda in comparison to South Africa, is extremely interesting because uh, basically you see uh, Nelson Mandela go to the uh, white supremacists. You know, it would be like the wife going to the beating husband and saying to uh, de Klerk, uh, Mandela said to de Klerk, look, you know, our times have changed. No longer are you entitled to uh, arrogate superiority as before. We now need to, do, you, you have to step down from that supremacy or su- uh, arrogance and you have to step, please step down, come down. Don't cry humiliation learn humility and join us all in a third realm in a new future where we all go together where we all join hands to to build a world of equality and dignity and he went mandela went to his downtrodden brothers and sisters and he did not uh, tell them to do what happened in rwanda namely to rise up to be empowered he told them yes you can get angry but in rwanda the formerly servants, Hutu means servant, the former servants rose up and they tried to exterminate all their former masters, the Tutsis. So they were empowered too far, you could say. And uh, that is what Mandela avoided. So therefore, I do not in my work use the word empowerment because I use the word entrustment because empowerment has no inbuilt uh, stop in the middle, you know, like 
in in this genocide in Rwanda, the, the start was an enthusiastic sense of empowerment in 1959 with the Hutu revolu revolution, uh, you know, rising up from far down and huge joy and, and it ended in genocide. So there uh, you see the, the, the empowerment um, needs to be needs to be transcended into something different. Therefore, I call it entrustment. Evelyn, you mentioned that you were a doctor and you worked in medical and psychiatric systems and you saw this degradation and humiliation happening around you. Let's bring our conversation into specifically the medical and psychiatric settings. What are some things that you think are important for us to look at when we're understanding humiliation and dignity and the roots of violence in medical and helping professions and, and, and psychiatry? What are some of the things that are really significant for us to focus on? Uh, what I felt when I was uh, working in that context was that what was missing was to see the, 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 I would even object to the terminology of per patient or client. I also in my own practice as a psychologist, as a clinical psychologist, I would kind of frame the situation that I was there with a fellow human being and that we together had to find a way and explore and hold hands in this exploration of what, what we could do. And uh, I must say that I like Martin Buber's um, differentiation between an I-though relationship as compared to an I-it relationship. An I-thou thou relationship is a relationship where I see the other as even almost a divine other being. And the con contact, our dialogue is, has a divine or, or a touch. And I always wanted to create that in my dialogue with everybody. I, I try to do that with everybody. And I do not, you know, and, and to, Buba describes then the I-it relationship where I treat uh, the it another person as it as a thing uh, and uh, I think this is this is the difference in uh, in every every context including psychiatry that um, in my 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 wish is always to approach another in an I thou uh, way and to see the fellow human being and hold hands together and um, of course if you if you have a baby and you have a child and you want to protect that child from harm you might need to hold that child but still you can hold the child in a way that is not i it and this is a very very fine difference where you hold a child and you say oh this is just a child and i need to you know to command the child to or to to um, so to lovingly hold a child and to uh, to instrumentalize or to treat a, a, another being as as an it as a thing, there is sometimes a, a fine line, especially when you need to protect another person. But uh, still, it is possible to to see another person as a fellow human being, as a beloved co uh, creature on this on this planet, and. Uh, not to treat it as an it, as a patient, or in my work, I would never use the terminology of I, uh, I studied this sample of population, the sample of population, and uh, that people are becoming samples, objects, uh, that uh, this to me is, a, is a, a way to speak about people that is inherently humiliating to my view. Yeah, so much about what we're talking about is about technology, that the technology world is a mechanistic world. There is a treating of objects and things and mechanisms, and you don't have a subjective-subjective relationship with machines. You have a control relationship with machines, and so that gets transferred over into our institutional arrangements where there are protocols and procedures, and there's an assembly line, and there's efficiency, and there's money at stake and you have to be operating on 
time schedules, and then so we end up having a mechanistic medical system. We end up having a mechanistic view where, yeah, people are treated like objects. And in certain contexts of the med- of medicine, like fixing a broken leg or something, obviously a certain kind of mechanistic perspective can be useful. But in the mental health context, where it's so much about relationships and feelings and communication, it's a complete disaster. I see so many really good people who are very deeply motivated by caring and compassion, and they get into mental health settings, agencies, early psychosis intervention programs, um, hospitals, peer support specialists, and they are bringing so much love and so much caring and so much empathy, and they're up against massive institutional forces, and they burn out. And then to be encouraging someone else to step in to where they burnt out and just keep the cycle going, I think is irresponsible. I think it has to be larger global perspectives and it has to be larger global solutions. And I think that the emphasis on, well, we're going to propose some mental health solutions over here, but we're not going to talk about American democracy and the corruption of money in politics. And we're not going to talk about the larger issues of our educational system or our prison system. We're just going to stay focused on our narrow little area of concern, which is what our grants pay for and our job descriptions say. I think that's a form of corruption. I think we start to feed off of the system that we're supposedly changing. We become professional complainers. And so I've made a very clear position that I don't do that anymore, that I always talk about the larger perspective and I'm always trying to connect the dots with bigger advocacy issues. And just it also makes me think of how important it is that the women's movement has been in this because they really pioneered this perspective of getting together, discussing the intimate interpersonal dynamics, and then bringing it into the larger institutional global practices and and power dynamics and big picture solutions that, that also touch on the intimate interpersonal problems. So where do you see some examples? Where do you see some positive changes happening? Where do you see your perspective of connecting the larger with the micro, the intimate with the global? Where do you see that playing itself out. In our work with the Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Network, uh, this is exactly what we try. We organize two conferences per year, and the main aim in these conferences is to to try, can we establish uh, an atmosphere of loving solidarity in a room uh, of people who are partly new, new, partly not new. So, in, for example, we just had our big workshop on humiliation, uh, transforming humiliation and violent conflict, at the uh, at Columbia University in uh, in New York, and each December, and there are a quarter of the participants are have been there before, and uh, or more perhaps, and the the rest newcomers, and so what we try is to seek. Can we embed everybody into this way of being together in loving solidarity rather than uh, in I it? Can we establish this I thou as an atmosphere, as a way to be in the room together? And uh, and it, it, pardon? Yes. We, f- we feel that we are extremely successful. It's a kind of experiment and um, uh, we, we, we learn each time to, to, do, uh, to do a next step, how to do it. And, but there's a, there is a very interesting, very easy research experiment in social psychology, which you might know, many listeners might know the, uh, the prisoner's dilemma game which is the game where you can either cheat on each other or cooperate. And when you take one group of students and uh, you tell them this is a community game, they will cooperate. If you give the same game with the same rules to another group of similar, and you tell them this is a Wall Street game, they will cheat on each other. So there is a framing there. A fra- the framing of the situation is extremely important, how you co- behave with each other. And at the moment, globally, we live in a Wall Street game frame. The institutions that we are a part of are form, shape our world as a Wall Street game and not as a community game. If we, if we play a community game, we are looked at as naive in the world out there. 
So in our conferences, we play the community game, you could say, and uh, we see how hugely nourishing and enriching this is for everybody. People say, I'm waiting all year for these two, two days of workshop in December. I hope the year will go fast that the, uh, the workshop comes. And these are professors in tenured positions who simply uh, do not have that atmosphere in, in a larger group. You might have cultivated with your spouse, perhaps, or in a small family, but in a larger group, uh, this is, uh, is and, and of highly uh, trained people, you know, the professors, PhDs, and who are used to uh, interact in quite a prof so-called professional way, where they, where you leave your soul at the door, in a way, and you you carry your CV in front of you. So, so this is this is um, this is our personal or or our work or my my work is to or part of this work is to see how can we foster, how can we nurture uh, uh, an atmosphere of dignify, dignity? How can we dignify? How can we uh, conduct a dignifying and dignified workshop? How can we manifest dignity in a room? This is so important what you say about expectation that the way we frame it, so many people are discouraged and they kind of almost expect a crisis to come or expect the situation to get worse. But what if we start to create the expectation that we do have a human capacity and it can be activated just as in the game. If you tell people it's a Wall Street game, then they treat it like a Wall Street game. If you tell them it's a community cooperation game, then there's a self-fulfilling prof prophecy that happens and it becomes more of a community game. And we see this in the power of the human mind and the power of, of group norms and the, the power of expectation. It's so important that we bring this to the work that we're doing. And I do see this in the psychiatric survivor movement, the critical psychiatry, the MAD movement, that we have wonderful values. We're all united for certain kinds of changes. We're putting out a critique of the system out there, but actually beneath the surface, it's the same society. We've got all the competition. There's scandals. There's conflict. There's misuse of power. There's people stepping on each other. There's suspicion. There's mistrust. There's disconnect. There's you know, people with their institutional agendas, there's people with their power that they're playing out. It's all happening. So in a sense, we're, we're not creating a safe sanctuary. We're sort of reproducing the, the problem within the movement. And that can be very confusing and very harming to people when they come in expecting something different because maybe they're younger or they're new to the whole idea of, of a movement. They're not sort of prepared that, well, you know, humans are humans everywhere. So I think you're presenting a challenge to all of us is in our gatherings, in our movements, in our organizations, can we really start embodying the values that we have? Can we not play the game of competition and feeling so good about being against the other people out there, but actually starting to have the dynamics and the experience of solidarity among each other in the present when we're together and working really in a spirit of mutual regard and dignity and collaboration. And you're pointing to the gatherings that you do, which have this quality, but at the same time, it's very difficult because bringing it back down into our day-to-day -day lives in the work that we're doing in, in the social movements, the organizations that we have in the day-to-day -day workplaces that we experience, that's really the challenge. That's really where the work needs to happen. I wanted to also ask you what you feel we could do as individuals, because we do live so isolated, so fragmented. We become individual consumer units. Everybody has their own nest that they're feathering, and there's a big competition and survival of the fittest sort of quality to it with private property. And at the same time, a lot of people are talking about, well, maybe that model is done. Maybe there's a way of collectivizing and, and shedding our separation and coming together and surrendering more to collaboration and community. What do you think might be done on just the individual level to drop out of the game of competition and move into a more of a game of cooperation and collaboration? Yes, I, I would, I would uh, frame this slightly differently. I see myself not <clears throat> as stepping out. I see myself of stepping in, stepping into something new, shaping a new reality. And this is a decision that everybody can make. And I would, uh, I would be very careful in, in saying stepping out uh, as the, the, uh, the main thing. Like if you want, if you have a house that is crumbling or a, a ship that is almost sinking and you want to build an, another one that is not sinking 
then uh, during the time while you are building, you need to have one one leg in the old house or the old ship. You cannot simply step out and build the new something new like like, like that. You need to have this con this uh, this connection. I think that is. Uh, important with one leg to stay within what is and with one leg uh, try to manifest step into something new and manifest something new we are just about out of time give people contact information how they can get in touch with you if they want to find out more about your work please go to the website of uh, this network of this global dignity family and it is www.humiliationstudies, in one word, .org, humiliationstudies.org. And uh, click on contact us and send an email to Judith. She is the wonderful woman who is at the other end when you send an email there. And she will forward it to me. And uh, when you see uh, mistakes on this website, tell me, because I'm the webmaster. All mistakes are mine. <laughs> Eveline Lindner, thank you so much for being on Madness Radio with us today. I have to thank you. You've been listening to an interview with Eveline Lindner. She is a scholar and founding president of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies. She was nominated three times for the Nobel Peace Prize for her visionary work. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio host is Will Hall. Producer is Nina Packabush. Madness Radio is an affiliate of Madden America Radio, broadcasting on KBOO in Oregon, sponsored by Portland Hearing Voices and The Icarus Project, and syndicated on the Pacifica Network. Madness Radio is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio and at maddenamerica.com.